Okay, we're going to get the class started here. If we could start out by people typing into the chat box whether or not they can hear me all right. Of course, I suppose if you can't hear me, you can't hear that I'm telling you to tell me if you can hear me. <laughs> all right, so welcome to traditional holiday foods of the world. I'm excited to be uh, doing this particular class because I love holidays. So this is, um, of course, most holidays don't feel uh, quite so holiday-like if they don't include your favorite foods. So, um, so I think that foods is a really good place to start when it comes to um, celebrations. Some introductions for those of you who don't know. My name is Kip Sienna Hopkins and I'm the marketing manager and graphic designer at the Blue Hill Co-op. I'm also a blogger, a Japan enthusiast, and though it's not written here, I am a uh, enthusiast of holidays and um, cultural festivities in general. Uh, as you can see, here I am with my long suffering cat for our annual Christmas portrait. He was not on board, um, but uh, yeah, that's me. A little bit about my blog, it's wishokuday.com, and it's a blog about Japanese food and culture. Um, I also write about my experiences with Japanese cuisine um, as I uh, continue on my journey of learning all about it. I've been working with Japanese food for uh, about five years um, and writing my blog for five years also. No, I guess, I guess I've been cooking for 10 years and I've been um, doing my blog for about five years. I also give uh, information about different um, types of food, dishes, uh, ingredients, whatnot. Sometimes I give recipes. Recently, I've been doing some keto recipe variations. Um, I also do some cultural exploration. So for instance, if you get interested in um, Japanese Christmas, which I will talk about a little later, you can go and read my two blog posts that I have about it. Um, I will also be writing a couple of blog posts this holiday season about various holiday foods in Japan. Um, and then I also give some Japanese history on there. Um, just a disclaimer before we go along, I will be talking about some holidays and festivals that I personally have never celebrated. So the information that I'll be giving is things that I have um, discovered through research and not from personal experience. So. Uh, if there's any incorrect information that you're aware of, definitely um, use the chat to let me know. Um, and do forgive me, it's not intentional. Also a note on pronunciations, there are a lot of different words in this that I do not know how to pronounce since I have never heard them spoken out loud. Um, and unless it's a Japanese word, I'm probably not gonna know how to pronounce it properly. So I do apologize if uh, that gets grating. But I oftentimes call this the season of holidays because many different cultures and um, religions and uh, communities have holidays that take place in this winter time season. Of course, there are some big ones that we know well in America, such as Hanukkah and Christmas and Kwanzaa, but there are a lot of little ones that happen in between them, a lot to, um, a lot that are connected to some of those holidays, or rather connected to Christmas, um, and some that are more obscure. We won't be going into recipes for all of these different um, holidays, but I did just wanna mention the ones that I'm aware of that happen this season. Um, we're starting off with Hanukkah this year, um, which moves around, but this year it's starting things off. And it's uh, December 10th to December 18th this year. Then we have St. Lucia Day, which is on December 13th. Last um, Posadas is December 16th to the 24th, which is a um, holiday that is celebrated with, oh, excuse me, in um, Mexico and with a lot of Latinx um, communities in the world. And it celebrates um, the, or uh, commemorates um, Mary and Joseph's uh, seeking of shelter. Um, the winter solstice this year is on December 21st, and that also is Yule, um, which is a neo-pagan holiday, also December 21st, and it's also um, Pancha uh, Ganap 
Kat Ganapati. See, I've already run into a pronunciation problem. Uh, that is also on the 21st. That is a um, Hindi uh, holiday that celebrates Ganesh. Then we have Christmas Eve on December 24th, Christmas Day on December 25th, Boxing Day on December 26th, and then Kwanzaa starts on the 26th and goes till January 1st. Then we of course have New Year's Eve, which is December 31st, and New Year Day, which is uh, January 1st, and then Chinese New Year, which is February 12th. That one's a little bit further removed, but since it's a really big holiday with um, China, uh, Chinese communities around the world and in China, obviously, and a lot of other Asian countries, I include it here. And it also moves around. So sometimes it's a little bit closer to these other holidays. Um, so yes. And so uh, as we move along here, I have some recipes for some different holidays. So I'm going to categorize them by holiday in order of appearance. Um, so we're gonna kick things off with Hanukkah, the Jewish festival of lights. Hanukkah is an eight night festival that commemorates the rededication of the second temple of Jerusalem. Um, it uh, starts on the night of the 25th day of Kislev in the um, Jewish calendar. It's usually sometime in November or December. This year, of course, it starts on the 10th, which is tomorrow. Um, Probably the most recognized symbol of Hanukkah is the uh, menorah, which is a nine branched candelabra. Um, on each of the eight nights of Hanukkah, an additional, and then, excuse me, an additional candle is lit using the middle candle until all nine are lit on the final night. Uh, this is to celebrate the miracle of oil, the miracle of the oil, which was when the menorah of the second temple uh, only had one day's worth of oil to burn, uh, but it stayed lit for eight days, which was the exact time needed to prepare more kosher oil for said uh, menorah. And thus, uh, that was the miracle of oil, which is uh, part of the big symbolism of Hanukkah. Uh, other traditions include playing dreidel, um, gathering with friends and family, exchanging gifts, in exchanging gifts, eating, of course. Religiously speaking, Hanukkah is a fairly minor holiday. It's attained major, major cultural significance, though, in modern times because of its proximity to Christmas, and it's become a counterpart and a alternative to uh, Christmas. As for some tr traditional foods of Hanukkah, a lot of the foods eaten during this holiday are um, highly symbolic and they're often fried foods or um, which are made to celebrate the miracle of the oil and um, cheesy foods are also prevalent, uh, which is in honor of Judith, um, who according to tradition, fed cheese to an Assyrian general to make him thirsty and then gave him plenty of wine to get him drunk. And once he was drunk and fallen asleep, she beheaded him. Thus cheese is eaten in her honor. Uh, but some of the most popular foods are latkes, which are potato pancakes, um, sufganyat, uh, which are jelly donuts, beef brisket, uh, kugel, which is a type of casserole made with egg noodles, challah, which is a braided bread, apple cake, uh, hamstenchen, which are uh, cookies, they're like lemon poppy seed cookies, uh, soft pretzels, um, lauka mades, which are uh, little fried puffy things that are like rolled in honey, and um, cheesy blintz, which are um, little cheesy pancakes. Um, and as mentioned, other cheese dishes and fried foods. So definitely not for the faint of stomach, um, but also highly delicious. We're gonna start off with a recipe for latkes, potato pancakes. Um, these are a tradition that started in the um, sort of Northern European uh, areas where potatoes are really popular. Um, wintertime food because they keep so well. 
So potato pancakes actually are used in a lot of Northern European cooking and um, cuisines inspired by such. My grandmother actually had a potato pancake recipe that she made a lot, um, that was French Canadian. Uh, but latkes are the uh, Hanukkah variation and they're often eaten with um, sour cream or applesauce. And for this recipe, you're gonna need um, five large potatoes and um, one small onion, two eggs, a quarter cup of flour or breadcrumbs, and uh, one and a half teaspoons of coarse kosher salt and some freshly ground black pepper. And then of course, you'll need some oil for frying. Um, traditionally, you would use olive oil. You can use um, vegetable oil if you'd like, or you can use coconut oil. I like to use coconut oil for fried foods because it gives a lighter, um, a lighter fry. To start off with, you're gonna wanna wash your potatoes and um, cut off any bad spots or um, deep eyes. I actually used a food processor to grate my um, potatoes, which I found very helpful. And then uh, you will also grate your onion. Once you're done doing that, you can use a damp, clean towel and pile all of your uh, potatoes and onions onto that. And then you're gonna wanna um, hold the tops together so you have a nice little bundle and squeeze the top so that you get all of the liquid out. Um, and uh, you wanna like drain it into the sink, but you wanna get all the excess liquid out that you can. Then you put that in a bowl and add in your other ingredients, uh, besides the oil, obviously, and you're gonna mix it all together. Then you're gonna bring your oil up to temperature. Um, you're gonna use about an inch of oil in your pan. And um, I didn't have a specific temperature for this, but you want it to be nice and hot. I put my stove at about, um, medium low and then uh, you'll know your oil is hot enough when you put in a little bit of batter and um, bubbles spring up around it right away. To form your latkes you're going to want to use a spoon and put a blob on it, um, make it into a nice round shape, put it into the oil, Try don't um, overcrowd them but put as many as you can fit without overcrowding into your pan and then you'll wanna squish it flat with your spoon. And you'll cook those for about three to four minutes on either side, um, which will get them nice and golden brown and crispy. So they look like this. Mine were a little messy, but that's all right. And once they're finished cooking, you'll wanna drain off the excess oil onto a paper bag or some paper towel on a tray, um, just to get the excess off and then you will serve them. They're definitely best hot. And um, as I said before, you can serve them with sour cream or with applesauce. I really like these. Um, as I said, my grandmother had a potato pancake recipe that she used to make a lot and these were pretty similar. Perhaps a little bit closer to hash browns than to her recipe, but they were definitely really good. Um, the single onion in there really um, pervaded the whole, uh, the whole recipe nicely. It didn't um, overpower it, but it definitely gave it a really nice even flavor. Of course, I love that crispy outside and the soft inside. It was definitely really delicious. So highly recommend. Next up, we have sufganiyat, which are jelly donuts. Um, these are certainly one of the most uh, iconic of the Hanukkah foods. And they're highly delicious and highly, um, highly difficult to stop eating. <laughs> so uh, I would say that um, this is a great recipe, even if you're not celebrating Hanukkah, just um, to try your hand at making some donuts. Um, because I had never made donuts in, a, uh, in the frying donut sense. I've baked donuts, but I've never fried donuts before. So I was a little nervous about it, but it was super easy. So to start with, you're gonna want some instant dry yeast, some warm water, a uh, quarter cup of sugar plus one teaspoon, plus some more for rolling your donuts in if you'd like a nice sugary dusting on them, two and a half cups of all-purpose flour, two large eggs, uh, two tablespoons unsalted butter at room temperature, some nutmeg, a little salt, 
and then you'll want your oil for frying, vegetable oil or olive oil or coconut oil. And then you'll want one cup of seedless raspberry jam. Um, I think raspberry jam is definitely the, the traditional standard. Um, I actually used strawberry jam for that because that's what I had on hand and it was good, but um, raspberry would be good too. So to begin with, you're going to put your warm water and your yeast and a teaspoon of sugar together in a bowl and let that uh, foam for about 10 minutes probably. Um, then you're gonna put your flour into a bowl, create a well in the center and put your other ingredients besides obviously the jelly and the oil. And then you're gonna add in your yeast when it is done bubbling and you're going to then take a wooden spoon and begin to stir it together, starting with the um, contents inside the well and then pulling in the flour as you go along until you have a nice sticky dough. Then you're going to want to start kneading it. Um, you're gonna knead it for probably about five minutes until you have a shiny dough um, that springs back when you poke it. Uh, the, the dough here um, is actually probably Mm, about two minutes away from being ideal. Then you're gonna to wanna to grease a bowl, uh, put your dough in there, cover it and let it sit for one to one and a half hours until it's doubled in size in a warm place. Then you're gonna to wanna to, um, flour a surface and put your dough on it. And then you're gonna to wanna to roll it out to about a quarter inch thickness. And then you want about a two and a half diameter cutter, uh, whether that's a cookie cutter or the top of a jar or something of the, the type, um, you're gonna wanna cut out some circles. This recipe made about 20 and I used, I had to um, roll out the scraps from the first run. So it was about two, but I ended up with some scraps at the end that I just fried like fried dough. That was really yummy. Uh, once you've cut those out, you wanna put a damp towel over them and let them sit for 15 minutes. While that's happening, you will want to bring your oil up to temperature. This recipe, it is very important to have your oil at the right hotness or you will not get as puffy results. I actually have a fryer that has a thermometer attached to it that I used for this, um, but you can also use a thermometer that clips to the side of a pot. And the temperature you'll want for that is 170 degrees. Um, so once your oil is up to temperature and your um, donuts have finished uh, their, their resting time, uh, you'll wanna use a slotted spoon to um, put the circles into the oil. Uh, again, you don't wanna crowd them. I used about four in my pan, which is about a 11 by 11, I think. Um, and they actually cook really fast. So they're about 40 seconds on each side and you wanna turn them and they should look nice and golden brown. Uh, just like with the lock keys, you can drain off the excess oil onto a used paper, not used paper bag, I mean, used is fine, I guess, but onto a paper bag and, um, or you can use um, a tray lined with a uh, paper towel. While they're still hot, if you want sugar on the outside, um, you will want to roll them in some sugar. Um, they won't, it won't stick if they're cool. So you'll want to do that while they're still hot. Be careful uh, not to burn yourself. I definitely burned myself a little bit. <laughs> um, uh, I did about half of my donuts um, in uh, sugar and half without, both was good, but the sugar definitely does um, have a certain something about it. Uh, as for filling your donuts, um, I unfortunately got halfway through my project before I realized that I did not have any pastry bags nor any Ziploc bags in the house, uh, nor could I find any of my pastry chips. So I had to go uh, a different direction and <laughs> make a hole in the side using a spoon, kind of hollow out the center, and then just sort of um, shove some jelly uh, inside. It was messy, but it worked. Um, but if you're more prepared than me and you have some pastry tips and a pastry bag, or at the very least, a Ziploc bag, um, you can just make a hole in the side of it using like a toothpick or a skewer and then pipe in about two teaspoons of jelly. Um, and that is the jelly donut. Um, mine probably would have been a bit more puffy if I had used real sugar for it. I only used about a teaspoon of real sugar um, 
for the yeast to have something to start with, but I um, don't eat sugar personally. I haven't eaten sugar in about uh, five years. So um, I ended up using uh, monk fruit for this. And um, it worked well, they tasted delicious. They just probably would have been a little puffier if the yeast had had more sugar to work with. Um, but they were really delicious. The texture was excellent. Um, the jelly went really well with the not too sweet um, dough. So it had a nice, um, it wasn't like overpoweringly sweet. Um, like I said, the recipe made about 20 and only two of us in my household actually um, can eat grains. So uh, when I was making them, I was like, oh, it's gonna make like 20. And she was like, oh, well, maybe we can freeze them, which was hilarious because of course we ate them all within a day. Um, so hopefully you have more than two people eating them, but I won't judge you if it's just you either. Um, yeah, they were really good. Next up on our list of holidays, we have St. Lucia Day or Santa Lucia Day. Um, and this is a holiday that celebrates uh, Lucia of Syracuse who brought food to Christians who were hiding in the Roman catacombs. Excuse me a second. Uh, it's celebrated on December 13th. And it's mostly celebrated in Scandinavia and in Italy. Um, because St. Lucia wore a wreath lit uh, with candles um, to light her way in the catacombs, that has become a symbol of St. Lucia Day. In Scandinavia, little girls will wear wreaths um, of the same kind and white robes with red sashes to look like St. Lucia. And uh, they will often um, sing and go in procession and bring um, St. Lucia buns to members of the community. Um, and if you're worried about little girls wearing uh, flaming candles on their heads, a lot of the time it's more of a symbolic thing and they're made out of belts or paper or something like that. Um, but uh, certainly for older girls, they can be uh, real candles. Some of the other traditional foods of St. Lucia Day um, are uh, lusicat, which are the saffron buns, which are certainly the most iconic. Um, other kinds of sweet braided bread um, that are meant to represent the wreath that St. Lucia wore. They're often um, glazed and I'm sure delicious. Um, Pepperkakar, which are Swedish ginger cookies. Um, glog, which is a type of mulled wine. And then um, Swedish meatballs, which are one of my favorites. Oh, excuse me, I'm having a tickly nose. So uh, Lusikat are St. Lucia buns, saffron buns. Um, and they're absolutely delicious and very um, pleasing to the eye and super easy to make. So you're gonna want some instant dry yeast, some warm water, some sugar, unsalted butter that's melted, uh, heavy cream whole milk, um, some crushed saffron threads, some salt, and two eggs for the recipe and another egg for the glaze. And then you'll want uh, four to four and a half cups of all-purpose flour. Of course, whenever you're making a bread item, it's always a good idea to have a little extra flour to hand um, to help with, uh, well, to flour your surfaces for one thing, and then also to help with the consistency because bread is notoriously changeable when it comes to that. As for the saffron threads, we do actually um, carry them at the co-op. If you're in the bulk department where we have the bulk spices, if you just walk around the corner to that end cap that's facing the refrigerators, um, we have some saffron threads right there. Okay, so to start with, you're gonna put your yeast and a teaspoon of your sugar and your warm water into the bottom of your bowl. After it's had a chance to foam up a bit, about five minutes later, you will put in your um, other ingredients besides the flour. And the saffron threads you will want to crush up um, before putting them in. And then you'll want to mix that all together and then start adding your flour in a cup at a time. Um, you will want to switch to your hands at some point um, and start to knead it. Um, and you may need to add more flour as you go. And once you have a dough that is um, silky and 
shiny and it springs back when you poke it, you will put it into a greased bowl and cover it. And then you're actually gonna refrigerate it um, for at least two hours and up to 24 hours. Uh, once that is completed, you will turn your dough out onto a floured surface, dust the top a little bit, and then you're gonna wanna cut it into uh, 24 sections. Um, once you have those sections cut out, um, mine were not very even, um, so I had a lot of uh, variation in the size of my, um, of my buns, but uh, you can um, take each section and roll it into a rope. Um, mine were about seven inches long, which seemed to work well. And then you'll want to line some trays with some parchment paper and take each rope and roll each end um, in opposite directions to form the um, appropriate shape, which is sort of a curly S. Not sure about the significance of the shape, but that's what it is. Then you're gonna to wanna to cover these with a damp towel and you're going to let them rise for 45 minutes until they have doubled in size. Before you put them in the oven, you will want to uh, make a glaze with an egg and a little bit of water. And then you wanna really glaze as much of the bun as you can reach. Um, so as you can see, one of these ones has a corner that you can tell the glaze didn't quite make it to and it just looks a little buff. And uh, they definitely look a lot better if you glaze them thoroughly. And you're gonna wanna cook those at 375 for just 12 minutes until they're golden brown and puffy. Um, you definitely don't wanna overcook them. They don't take a long time to cook. St. Lucia buns or lucicats are wonderful things. They are so light and fluffy, mildly sweet. The saffron is like not overpowering, but it's definitely prevalent. So it's kind of a slightly earthy flavor, but it goes so well with the light airy texture. Um, they're really beautiful, uh, totally pleasing to the eye, and they're really easy to make. The, the, the only thing about them is that you have to let them rise, um, but as long as you're um, prepared for that, which shouldn't be any problem, they're a really lovely treat to have around. Um, also note, you can take uh, raisins and put them into the curlies on either side. Um, I personally do not like raisins in the, the least, so I did not do that, but you can totally do that. It's sort of traditional. It's not like blasphemous to not do it, but you can also do it. Next up on our holiday list, we have Yule, uh, which is celebrated on the winter solstice, December 21st this year. So actually, um, you'll probably notice that I have more uh, information about two holidays in particular, Yule and Christmas. That is because those are the, tr the two traditions that I actually personally celebrate. I would probably categorize myself as a secular pagan, if that is such a thing. Um, and I've definitely celebrated Yule um, in the past a lot. Uh, but Yule is a modern pagan revival of pre-Christian traditions. Um, Generally, it's a celebration of the return of light and sometimes the rebirth, rebirth of the horned hunter god um, as part of his annual cycle, but there's a lot of variation in that um, depending on who's celebrating it. Yule has its origins in the pre-Christian Germanic Yuletide festival. Uh, many of these traditions were actually adapted into Christmas after Christianity took root in Northern Europe. Um, things like carols and evergreens, and the Yule log, obviously, and like mistletoe are just some of the traditions that were sort of co-opted. Um, it's celebrated in heathenry, which is contemporary Germanic paganism, uh, Wiccanism, um, Levian Satanism, which is not actually devil worship, but a um, atheistic uh, organized religion. And um, it's also celebrated by a lot of other non-categorized uh, neo-pagans. Um, as I said, everybody celebrates it a little bit differently. Um, try, some, try, bleh, some try to stick as close to ancient Germanic practices as possible, um, but because actually not that much is known about ancient Germanic um, customs uh, as far as religion goes, there's some guesswork there. 
um, but a lot of people try to go as close as they can. Um, others use an amalgamation of different practices from pagans all over the place. Um, for some groups like the um, Asteru Folk Assembly, which is a uh, American pagan organization. Uh, Yule is actually celebrated for 12 days, starting with the solstice. Um, for new converts to neo-paganism, Yule can oftentimes feel similar to Christmas, um, thanks to their shared origin. Um, often Yule involves feasting and gift giving. Uh, they also sometimes include the Yule log, which is a, an honest to goodness wooden log um, that is uh, decorated with like berries or other natural objects, pine cones, fir tree branches, stuff like that. Um, and then it's got some candles on top of it, which you burn down on Yule. And then you use the uh, log itself to um, burn in the hearth to warm up your house. And in a lot of traditions, um, the remainder of the previous year's log is used to kindle the fire that you burn this year's, uh, this year's, what do you call it? Yule log in. Um, but you can also see um, some of the uh, remaining prevalence of Yuletide in, um, in a lot of Germanic countries' uh, words for Christmas itself. Um, there's still Yule, like in um, Norway, how you say Merry Christmas in Norway is uh, good y'all. Um, let's see. As far as traditional foods of Yule go, uh, there isn't like really a hard and fast rule about this one because there's so much variation in how people celebrate it, but some um, some more common uh, foods that you might see at a Yule celebration would be like cider or ale or mulled wine, some roast meats, um, some like Northern European style food. Um, and then of course there's the Yule log cake, which is what we're making here. Um, the Yule log cake is also a traditional Christmas dessert, um, but it was born from the Yule log tradition. So a lot of neo-pagans will make Yule log cakes as well. Um, but if you're making it for Christmas, it's known as the Boucher de Noël. It's a French dessert. Um, so I actually made two different Boucher de Noëls. Um, this one is a chocolate, which is sort of the traditional flavor, um, and it's keto. So for those of you who don't know, ketogenic um, is a low carb, higher fat content um, diet that does not do sugar. Um, so uh, it uses um, almond flour, psyllium husk, which helps a bit with the texture, cocoa powder, um, swerve confectioner sugar, which is a um, alternative sweetener made with erythritol, which is a sugar alcohol and it doesn't have an aftertaste and it doesn't wreak havoc with your intestines. So it's great. Um, it also has baking powder, salt, butter, eggs, uh, heavy cream and vanilla. And then for the filling, it's a uh, heavy cream monk fruit sweetener, which is a natural uh, sugar-free sweetener that also has um, no aftertaste or discomforting uh, side effects and um, some vanilla. So pretty much filling is just whipped cream. Um, frosting, I made a um, cream cheese frosting for this, which was just cream cheese, butter, um, the swerve powdered sugar, uh, which I just realized I called confectioner sugar somewhere and then powdered sugar somewhere else, but whatever, it's the same thing. <laughs> um, some heavy cream, uh, you may need to adjust the volume, and then um, some cocoa powder uh, for the chocolatiness of it. And then optional, you can use some dried figs to make some lovely little mushroomy things um, to give your uh, log some authentic appearance. So to start with, you are going to um, put together all of your dry ingredients for the cake and sift them. This is an important step because the um, swerve confectioner sugar tends to lump if you don't um, sift it. So it'll be fine if you sift it, but otherwise you might end up with some, some lumpies. So um, you'll wanna sift those all together and then you will want to mix together all of your wet ingredients. Be sure to be mixing the eggs when you pour in the um, butter so you don't accidentally cook them. And then you're gonna mix your wet ingredients in with your dry ingredients until you have a nice thick batter such as this. 
<laughs> excuse me. Um, so I used a jelly roll pan for this. It was a nine by 13 rectangular jelly roll pan, which is the exact size of the inside of my ridiculously tiny oven um, because I have a, um, a confection oven that is really just a glorified toaster. Uh, if you happen to, to take our first class, which was um, Japanese, basics of Japanese cooking, I made a jelly roll in that and I actually had to go to my aunt's house to make it in her larger oven. And since we're in different bubbles, I had to do it while she was at church and it was a whole complicated process. So after that, I bought my own jelly pan that's exactly the size of my oven. And uh, that's what I used here. So you're gonna wanna grease the pan, put down some parchment paper and then actually grease the top of the parchment paper too, cause you don't want it sticking. So then you're gonna um, spread out your uh, thick batter on into the pan and sort of push it all the way to the edges. And then you're actually going to cook this for uh, 10 minutes at 350 degrees. It's a really short bake. Um, you definitely don't wanna overcook it. And in fact, you will take it out of the oven and gonna go, it's not cooked all the way, um, but it, it's fine. Um, it, it should be fine. Uh, this cake actually would have made an excellent brownie by itself as well, by, by the way. Once you have it out of the oven, you will want to take it out of the pan and then let it sit for like three minutes. Then you're gonna actually pre-roll it while it's still warm to teach the cake what to do. Um, this is actually a pretty fragile cake, this keto version. So you will want to do it really gently. And as you're doing it, you can peel the, um, the parchment paper off of it. And I would use a clean piece of parchment paper over the top of it um, so that um, it doesn't stick to itself. Uh, you'll want the top of the cake, what was on top when you baked it, to be the inside of your roll in this case. Um, if it breaks a little bit, like don't freak out. Um, it's uh, usually pretty easy to stick it back together and you're gonna be frosting the whole thing anyway. Um, to make your uh, frosting, you'll wanna make sure that your cream cheese and your butter are both room temperature to start out with. It'll make things a lot easier. You can put it in a stand mixer or use a hand mixer, a stand mixer or a hand mixer. <laughs> and um, you're gonna wanna um, whip that until it's uh, nice and creamy and um, blended. Then you're gonna wanna um, sift in your confectioner sugar. Again, you'll wanna sift it because otherwise it'll um, clump, which will not make for a, a nice clean frosting. Uh, sorry about the confusion. This actually is a chocolate frosting. I just used the same frosting for both my cakes and the other one was a blonde cake. So I added the chocolate separately and forgot to take a picture of it. But uh, you're gonna to wanna to, um, whip together your sugar and your cream cheese and butter and your vanilla. And then um, once it starts to get kind of powdery crumbly, um, you wanna start adding in your heavy cream. Actually, I think I used half and half until you've got a nice um, smooth, creamy, light uh, frosting. Then you can add in your cocoa powder as needed, which you should also blend, I mean sift. Then you're gonna to wanna to make your filling which again is just um, whipped cream. I'm sure you probably know how to make whipped cream, but you just wanna take your cream, put it in your bowl uh, and uh, start to whip it when it's about halfway whipped, add in your sugar and your vanilla and then whip it up until you have whipped cream. Don't over whip it or you will get butter, sweet vanilla flavored butter. Once your cake is completely cool, unroll it gently and spread your whipped cream when I was doing the dry run of this uh, of this class, I kept calling whipped cream cream cheese. So I'm gonna try really hard not to do that this time. Um, so you're gonna spread your whipped cream over the top of it, and then you're going to gently roll your cake back up. Uh, once it's rolled back up, put it on a plate and put it into the refrigerator for about 30 minutes to let it kind of firm up. Once it's out, you will take your frosting and frost the outside of the cake. Um, and make sure you go all the way down to the edges so that you have a nice coverage. And I kind of um, left some vertical lines on it because you're kind of mimicking bark, you know, so give it a little texture. And then I took a fork and just made some nice bark patterns in the frosting. I gave it a little swirly. Um, 
in between, like in between each of the lines or, you know, each of the streaks, um, you wanna wipe the frosting off of the fork. Otherwise it'll all just smash together. Not some nice definition there. And then optionally, you can cut some dried dates in half and stick them on the outside of the cake to, um, to imitate some fungi. Um, then you're gonna wanna trim the ends off so you have a nice clear spiral on either end. I am really impressed by how nicely this came out. Um, it had a great texture. It was like a really good chocolate cake, just like on its own. It was very similar to like a cakey brownie. Um, in fact, as I mentioned earlier, you could totally just make this cake as a brownie. I, it was quite yummy. Um, it wasn't too sweet. It had a really nice combination with the sweet frosting and the um, whipped cream. Press, it just looks like really impressive. Um, so it would be great to like really wow people when it's actually not that difficult to make like at all. Uh, considering how short the cook time is, um, it really is a cake that you can like oddly enough like throw together. I will certainly be making it again. Next up, we have the Blonde Boucher de Noël uh, or Yule Log Cake. So this came about because uh, we have a lot of dietary restrictions in my family. There are a lot of allergies over here. Um, so one of my family members uh, can't eat grains and eats mostly keto. And the other one um, can't eat nuts, which is oftentimes what they use for keto baking. And she also can't have um, chocolate. So when I was making, uh, when I'm making any desserts, really, I usually make uh, two different versions, one keto, one um, not regular because uh, none of us eat sugar, but um, one grain having uh, dessert <laughs> um, and non-chocolate. So that's how the Blonde Boucher de Noël came about. And I, as you can see, have made it into a birch log. Um, and it came out so nice that here is the recipe for all of you. Uh, so the cake itself is made with four large eggs with some sugar, vanilla, salt, and cake flour. I actually used um, spelt flour and it worked just fine. The filling is again, um, pretty much just uh, whipped cream. But after I made it, I realized that um, I could have done something cooler. So as you can see, this uh, birch log has some brown stripes on it. And that was actually made not with chocolate, but with instant coffee granules that I ground up in my surabachi, which is just a mortar and pestle, um, and uh, added to some of the frosting. And after I made this, I realized that if I had ground up some of the coffee granules and put it into the, um, the whipped cream, not only would it have been delicious, uh, but it would have given a little bit more definition to my spiral. So that's an option if you want to go the next level with your, with your Boucher de Noël. Um, then for the frosting, it's the same frosting recipe uh, before, um, just minus the chocolate. And, um, and then you're going to want to set aside just a little bit of the frosting and add those ground up coffee granules so that you can have a darker side. Um, and then optional, obviously, you'll uh, have the dried figs that you can do as some um, fungi substitutes. So to start this one, you are going to want to uh, preheat your oven to 400. And then you will want to pre-prepare your pan. It's more important for this one that you get it into the oven quickly because it's sort of a sponge cake. So you'll want to grease the pan, put down the parchment paper, and then grease the parchment paper. No sticking. Um, and then you're going to take your eggs and you're going to put them into a mixer or use a stand mixer if you want to stand there for five minutes. And you're going to beat them until they are um, light and airy and fluffy, which they're not going to be like meringue, obviously, but you will get a lot of volume out of eggs if you beat them. Um, once you have reached the five minutes, you are going to add in your other ingredients besides the flour and you're gonna whip them for another two minutes. When it's done, it's gonna look kind of like insulation foam, uh, except for not as sticky. Um, 
Then you're going to take your flour and you're going to add it in about two to three tablespoons at a time. I sifted it directly into the batter as I went. And you're going to want to fold each batch of flour in gently um, until everything is fully incorporated. Do not over stir it because you'll make your cake a little bit tough. Then you're going to want to pour your batter into the pan and carefully smooth it so that it's nice and level on top. Then you're going to put it into the oven immediately and you're going to cook it for about eight to ten minutes until Mine was actually a little overcooked, but it came out all right anyway. But you'll want it to be a little uh, just um, springy when you touch the top of it. And then you'll want the edges to have just started to pull away. Uh, once you're done cooking it, you're going to invert it onto a clean towel and peel off the parchment paper. Uh, then you're going to let it rest for three minutes. And then you're going to roll it up with the, paper, uh, with the uh, towel. Um, you want to be gentle. It's not quite as fragile as the um, keto version, but um, definitely still be, uh, be careful with it. I'm going to leave that until it has uh, fully cooled down. As you can see, when I unrolled it, it was so trained to be rolled that I actually couldn't unroll it very easily. So I had to sort of fill it while rolled. Um, because we're using the same filling and frosting as the other one, I'm skipping those steps. So um, but they are included in your recipe packet. Uh, so you're just going to want to fill the inside with your cream cheese and then roll it back up. As you can see, I don't actually have three hands. I had to have my sister help me with this portion so that she could hold back one end so I could uh, fill the cream cheese in there. Um, then you're going to want to put it into the fridge for about a half hour. And when it comes out, you can frost the outside with your lovely blonde um, frosting. Uh, as you, I mentioned, I ground up some instant coffee granules and mixed them into a little bit of the frosting. And since this is a birch uh, log, I sort of did a um, sideways uh, texture with the frosting. And then I added in some brown stripes and I did put some more dates on there for um, natural effect. Then you want to trim off the end so you have a nice clear spiral. And there you have it. Uh, this was definitely really yummy. The cake itself was not too sweet, again, but even less so than the um, keto version, uh, which balanced so well with the sweet frosting. A lot of the time I find cakes a little overwhelming because you've got the sweet cake and the frosting, and it's like, ah, uh, but this was a really nice balance. The texture was great. It was a nice sponge. Um, yeah, my only thing would be that if I did it again, I would want to put some coffee uh, granules in the whipped cream so that it had a, a more clear spiral to it. Um, but as a first, first run, I definitely think it went really well. And look at how beautiful the two of them look together. Next up, we have Christmas, which is of course, December 25th. Uh, Christmas is the Christian holiday celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, as I'm sure you probably all know. It also incorporates many pre-Christian symbols and traditions, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you can either celebrate Christmas as a religious festival, or you can do it more secularly. Um, my family has always celebrated Christmas, although uh, we are not Christians. Um, but we really appreciate all of the uh, secular aspects of the holiday. Um, it's certainly my favorite holiday and I make a big deal out of it every year. Um, celebrated across the world though in Christian nations and Christian communities and just with Christians in general and other people. Um, there are many varying traditions depending on your location. A good example of this would be the magical being who brings gifts. Of course in the US this is Santa Claus which we borrowed from the Dutch Sinterklaas. Um, and in the UK, it's Father Christmas. In, um, let's see, in uh, other places, it's um, St. Nicholas. So that's all like, yeah, same, same. Um, but in Scandinavia, um, or in a lot of Scandinavian countries, it's a gnome-like being called um, Tomtis or Tomtu or Nise. Uh, in parts of Germany and in Austria, it's the Christ, uh, Christkin or Christ child represented by an angel. Um, and in many Central European countries uh, or traditions, they have uh, 
Krampus, a demonic half goat who gives gifts but also punishes misbehaving children. If that interests you, if you uh, enjoy darker um, stories, uh, last year I read Krampus the Yule Lord by um, Brom, which is a really dark Christmas novel that I highly recommend if that's your thing. Um, if you're interested in European Christmas traditions, like in general, um, I definitely recommend Rick Steves European Christmas, which I watch every year. I also own the soundtrack and the book, so obviously I enjoy it a lot. Um, the first recorded celebration of Christmas was in Rome on December 25th, 336 CE. Um, though it's not actually known what date Jesus Christ was born on, um, December 25th was selected for various reasons, a big one of which was its proximity to the solstice, which was a major pagan holiday um, all over at the time. This helped for converting pagans since they didn't have to give up their traditions that they already had. This is also why so many Christmas traditions can be traced to paganism. Uh, but back in the day, Christmas was like a month long festival. Remember the 12 days of Christmas? Um, I know 12 days isn't a month, but you can work with me. Uh, uh, this festival included a lot of saint days, um, feasts, uh, and religious observances. It was often like a really raucous festival with feasts and drinking and games and pageants and a lot of misbehavior. In fact, the Puritans banned it in England for a while when they were in charge. Uh, but by the 19th century, um, the holiday kind of transformed into a more family-centered holiday based around gift giving and religion and charity and goodwill towards all and all that stuff, um, rather than the sort of traditional revelry. Um, authors like Charles Dickens and Washington Irving did a lot to rebrand the holiday, so to speak. Um, in fact, you might not know this, but Charles Dickens didn't just write a Christmas carol, he wrote a lot of other Christmas books, including um, Cricket on the Hearth and ooh, I believe it's called The Chimes, The Bells, something like that. Um, I've read quite a few of them, they're pretty good, but none are quite as good as A Christmas Carol, which I read every year. Uh, today in America, at least, Tris Christmas. Christmas is celebrated with gifts and family and a Christmas tree and stockings, and carols and Santa Claus, um, like generally speaking. Um, but there are obviously a lot of foods associated with Christmas, just as there are a lot of traditions. Um, big ones would be fruitcake, gingerbread, whether the men or the house. Um, penitone, with penitone, I don't, I don't know how to say that, um, which is a candied fruit bread from Italy, and Stollen, which is a candied fruit bread from Germany, Babka, which is a chocolate swirl bread from Poland, um, eggnog, which is a delicious drink, um, buenalos, which are like a fried dough, Christmas pudding, of course, a British tradition, mince meat pies, also British, briskrat, which is a Norwegian rice porridge. That one's fun. They put an almond, one almond into the recipe and whoever finds the almond um, in their bowl gets a marzipan pig. Uh, Christmas cake is a Japanese tradition, um, which I did in the well, we already covered. Um, and many various Christmas cookies. If you are subscribed to our mailing list, um, last Bits and Bites newsletter, we had all about cookies and we had like 25 European Christmas cookie recipes on there. Um, so there are lots of Christmas cookies. We'll be getting into that later. Oh. Okay, sorry. Um, so to start with, we've got mincemeat pies. So like every year when we get into like November, my family is like, so what Chris kind of Christmas are we doing this year? Because um, Pretty much they mean, what kind of Christmas are you going to make us do? Uh, because I tend to do um, Christmases that are inspired by different uh, traditions. So it might be Scandinavian Christmas, which is what we're doing this year. It's my favorite kind. Um, but also we've done British Christmas a couple of times. And a part of British Christmas are mincemeat pies, um, which are delicious. Um, they come from Britain, as said, uh, but they were actually inspired by the Holy Land during the Crusades, um, where of course meat and fruits were often cooked together. And uh, people who were crusading were like, this is really good, we should do this at home. Um, 
so yeah, they're really popular in Britain for a long time. Uh, they also came to New England. Um, mincemeat pies in New England oftentimes don't actually have any meat in them. They're more like fruits and, and dried fruits and stuff, um, but sometimes they do. And they're usually full-size pies, unlike in Britain where they are little um, tartlet pilots. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I made these in um, cupcake trays. They're really nice serving size. Um, so for this recipe, we have the pie crust, uh, which this actually is like a double pie crust recipe, what I would do if I was doing a covered pie. Um, I like to cook them in batch, uh, make the doughs in batches though. I feel like it comes out better that way. Um, but this is for both of them. One cup of butter chilled, a uh, tisp of salt, three cups of flour, and like a half a cup to one cup of cold water. For the filling, it's a pound of ground beef, some salt, um, a pound and a half of apples, which are peeled and chopped, a third of a cup of butter at room temperature, um, three quarters of a tablespoon of nutmeg, a half a tablespoon of cinnamon, which might sound like, whoa, so much, but actually um, because you're like doing meat and fruits together, it definitely balances fine. It doesn't seem overspiced at all. Uh, then you're gonna want a half a cup of sultanas, which are golden um, raisins, and a half a cup of currants. As mentioned earlier, I really don't like raisins, so I actually just did a full cup of currants. Um, uh, then for an egg wash, you're just going to want an egg and a little bit of water. So to make your pie dough, you can take your flour and your salt and mix them together. And then you're going to want to cut up your chilled um, butter, put it into the flour, use your hands to um, mix it up until it's fully incorporated. You got like clumps that are no bigger than a pea. Then you're gonna to wanna to start to add in your cold water, a little drizzle at a time until you're just able to stick your pie dough together. Then you'll wanna form it into a puck and refrigerate it until, um, until you're ready to use it. As I said earlier, I like to make my uh, pie dough in two batches. So um, you can definitely do that as well. If you make it all at once, cut it into two pucks and put it in the fridge. So then you're going to want to um, cut up your apples that are peeled and you're going to want to cook your meat until it's nicely browned and you're going to want to sort of break it up into more manageable pieces. Mix together your apples and your butter and your dried fruits and your spices and then add in your meat and give it a nice stir. It's going to smell really good. In fact, like my whole house, all this like last two weeks is just like smelled like bakery and like Christmas all freaking all the whole time. <laughs> so then you're going to want to flour your counter and roll out your pie dough. And I think I used about a three inch circle uh, to cut these out, um, but you want it to be right size to fit into a um, cupcake pan. This made 12 Mince meat pies, so um, plan accordingly. So you're gonna wanna make all your little cups, fill them to the top, and then use the leftover dough to cut out some stars to put onto the top. <clears throat> then you're gonna wanna make a nice egg wash, wash the tops of them, and you're gonna wanna bake them at 375 degrees for about 20 minutes until they're nice and golden brown. They're really tasty. I love the combination of meat and spices and fruit. It's really tasty, like I literally just said. Um, I also uh, like the compact size. They're really easy to share and to give to people. I gave some to my aunt and to my sister's boyfriend um, who were both outside our bubbles. So I left them on the porch for them to grab. Um, as you can see, my cat thought they smelled really good, but he didn't get any. Um, yeah, I think that they're a really fun, um, different Christmas tradition that you should all incorporate if you celebrate Christmas. Uh, next up, we have Hasselnuss Macaronen, which are um, hazelnut meringue cookies from Germany. Uh, Christmas cookies are like popular all over the world, as already stated, but no one does them quite like Germany. Germany is famous famous for its uh, Christmas markets where many artisans sell their wares, um, including bakers who sell all kinds of Christmas cookies, or as they're called in German, uh, Plätschchen. 
P L A T Z C H E N. Yeah, it's a hard one. Um, most German Christmas cookies are spiced like gingerbread, um, or they're made and or they're made with nuts. Some are actually naturally gluten-free made with um, nut flours. And that's what Hasselnuss macaronen are. Um, though you can buy cookies from bakeries, they're also popular to make at home where families and family and friends will gather together and bake cookies all as a group. as like a nice nostalgic, um, delicious way to uh, commune together. Unfortunately, not this year, but you get the idea. Um, so this is made with two cups of hazelnuts, two thirds of a cup of white sugar and two egg whites. To start with, you're gonna find a pan that will fit all of your um, hazelnuts and you'll want to layer them all in one layer. And then you're going to toast them at 325 degrees for 10 minutes. Uh, then you'll wanna let them cool down so you don't burn your fingers. Um, and then you're just gonna wanna rub them between your hands to get off the papery skin. It's actually really easy to get it off. Um, and then you'll wanna put them into um, a, a tray or whatever, put them in a bowl, I don't care. Um, then you will want to set aside a half a cup of toasted hazelnuts to top your um, hazelnut macaronins. Um, Hasselnuss macaronins. Uh, and then you'll wanna take all the rest of your hazelnuts and put them in a food processor and blend, uh, grind them up into a flour. You could probably go a little um, finer than I have here, but it worked. Um, and you want just a cup and a half of that um, for the recipe. You'll probably have a little extra uh, from that amount of hazelnuts so you can seal that in an airtight container and store it for later. So then you're gonna to wanna to make your meringue with two egg whites. Make sure you don't get any egg yolk in it at all and that you're using a nice dry clean bowl. And you're going to start to beat the egg whites until they get foamy. And then you're gonna to start to add in your sugar. I would do it in probably three batches, blending or beating between each. And then you'll end up with a nice uh, meringue that will be um, shiny with stiff peaks. And you're going to want to carefully fold in your hazelnuts uh, flour until you have a nice batter. Don't overmix it though because it is meringue. Then you're going to want to form your cookies using a spoon. Um, it's about two tablespoons probably of, um, of meringue for each cookie. Um, space them out a little bit but they don't really uh, they don't really change in size so you should be good. And then just put a nice little hazelnut on the top and you're gonna bake them at 325 for 20 minutes. These are totally delicious and completely addictive. Uh, they've got really nice fluffy, but still crunchy because of the nuts um, texture. Um, yeah, the nuts have a really nice flavor. It goes really well with the meringue. Uh, totally easy to make, naturally gluten-free. I made it obviously with fake, uh, with monk fruit that monk fruit sweetener and it uh, worked really well. Definitely a, a big hit. Next on the list, we have Peruvian spiced hot chocolate. Um, this is a version of hot chocolate that is usually made with condensed milk. Um, and it can, depending on who's making it, it can be so thick that you could almost stand a spoon up in it. Uh, it's a popular part of the holiday season in Peru, though, um, so much so that there are gatherings that are actually just called um, chocolatadas, uh, which is um, where families get together and drink hot chocolate with panton and um, other sweet breads and exchange gifts. Uh, sounds quite lovely. Um, I actually made this vegan. I'm not vegan myself, but I would probably die if I had that much dairy all in one sitting. Um, so I actually made this with um, almond milk and coconut cream and coconut milk. You could certainly replace that with regular milk and condensed milk and evaporated milk, um, but I liked my version. So it's a um, quarter cup of sugar, a quarter cup of dark cocoa powder, quarter teaspoon of chipotle powder, 
a half a teaspoon of ground cloves, four cups of almond milk, one cup of coconut cream, one cup of coconut milk, um, a half cup of chocolate chips, and a tablespoon of cornstarch or potato starch. Um, and then optional toppings, whipped cream or whipped coconut cream and some cinnamon to sprinkle on there. You can also sprinkle some chocolate on there if you wanted more chocolate. Um, you could probably use marshmallows, whatever you think would be best. So to start with, you're gonna take your almond milk and your sugar and you're gonna put them in a pot and bring them to a little simmer for about two minutes. Then you're going to add in your coconut cream and your coconut milk, and you're going to stir that up and um, let that uh, heat up a little bit. Then you're going to add in your chocolate chips, your cocoa powder, and your spices. And you are going to um, constantly stir that as it continues to cook for another five minutes. You will definitely want to keep stirring it though because you don't want your chocolate chips to melt onto the bottom of your pan because that'll mess up your consistency. Then you're gonna keep doing that until it's all fully blended and your uh, chocolate chips have melted. Then you're gonna take your starch, put a little bit of water in it to dissolve it and then add that to it and cook for a further two minutes until you've got a nice thick hot chocolate. This actually makes a pretty big batch. So I saved um, most of it in a jar in my fridge that we could heat up over the, the course of the next couple of days. Um, this was really good and I really liked uh, just having like a, a nice cup of it, a, a little um, teacup of it. I couldn't drink like a whole big um, mug at once because it would be uh, really intense, but um, it was good. And I put some um, whipped cream on top, which really balanced the spice because I'm a total spice wimp. So, um, so that was a nice balance. Um, yeah, it was really good. It would be great for Christmas morning or Christmas Eve uh, for dessert or um, anything really. It was quite delightful. Next up we have the mysterious chocolate babka. Uh, I call it mysterious because I thought that I knew all about it. Well, not all about it, but I thought that I knew what it was at least after, even after I made it, I thought I knew what it was until I started doing research for this class. Um, it's called a Christmas bread but it's actually Jewish in origin. It's also eaten at Easter. I'm not entirely sure if it's eaten at Hanukkah or not. Um, I couldn't really suss that out. But at any rate, babka uh, is certainly uh, originated with Polish Jews um, who would roll up like leftover challah dough with cinnamon and dried fruits. Chocolate seems to be a later variation among Jewish bakers in New York. Um, as far as I can tell, uh, it spread to non-Jewish Europeans um, who embraced it for Christmas and Easter. Um, but it's really delicious. You could eat it for any holiday, really. Um, and uh, yeah, so pretty much it's a chocolate, a, a bread braided with a chocolate filling. Um, for the bread, you're going to want, uh, sorry, this is in the metric system, 125 milliliters of milk, uh, 15 grams of instant yeast, one teaspoon of vanilla extract, two eggs, 500 grams of flour, a quarter of a teaspoon of salt, 80, and 80 grams of butter at room temperature for the very delicious filling, uh, 400 grams of bittersweet chocolate, 50 grams of butter, one teaspoon of vanilla extract, 30 grams of cocoa powder, 20 grams of confectioner sugar, 100 grams of milk, 30 grams of sugar, and some for an egg wash, you want an egg, and some a teaspoon of water. Um, full disclosure, I didn't actually eat this because I made it regularly with tons of sugar in it, and I would die if I ate that. So not literally, but it would be rather unpleasant. Um, so uh, I am not going by my personal experience when I tell you how good it was, but I gave it to all of my coworkers at the co-op and I got rave reviews. So it, it has the opinion of many behind it. So to start with, you are going to mix together all of your um, wet ingredients together and oh, all of your ingredients together, except for the flour. And then you're gonna add the flour in a bit at a time, like a cup at a time. And um, once it starts to clump together, switch to your hand and start to knead it until you have a nice springy, uh, shiny, satiny dough. 
then you're gonna put a uh, grease bowl and cover it and let that sit for 30 minutes. While that's happening, you're gonna wanna melt your chocolate in a double boiler. And then you're going to, or just stack a pot on top of another pot and some water in it. Uh, then you're gonna to wanna to take your other ingredients, mix them together, and when the chocolate's melted, put that in there and stir it up. It's gonna be like really good brownie batter. Uh, then you're gonna to wanna to refrigerate that while your dough finishes rising. Then you're gonna flour a surface, um, put down your dough and you're gonna roll it out. So as far as rolling it out goes, I, even though it got rave reviews, I think that it would have been better if I had rolled it out thinner because I didn't feel like it had a really nice defined spiral of chocolate on the inside. But I think I rolled it out to about a half an inch. I think if I had done a quarter of an inch, it would have been better. But you're gonna want it in a relative rectangle shape. Then you're gonna spread your chocolate on it and then you're gonna roll it up. Um, it's gonna be messy, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, you're gonna take a knife or a bench knife and um, slice it lengthwise down the middle with a little bit of a connector at the top. Then making sure that you keep the chocolate part turned upwards. You wanna um, braid it or you know twist it into a braid. You're gonna want a greased bread pan. I didn't have a bread pan because despite all appearances, I don't actually cook bread very often. Uh, so you're gonna wanna find a, a suitable pan, um, grease it, put in your bread, and then cover it um, and let it rise for another hour. Preheat your oven to 325 degrees and uh, glaze your bread with your egg wash. Uh, you're gonna wanna cook it for about 30 to 50 minutes, depending on your oven. Um, you might wanna put some tin foil on the top so that it uh, doesn't get too brown. But once you can turn it out of the pan and tap on the bottom and it sounds hollow, it should be good to go. Um, like I said, I didn't actually eat it myself, but it seemed to have a great texture. One of my coworkers told me it was better than the one she got from a bakery on Staten Island. So there's that. Uh, <laughs> highly flattered. Um, but yeah, and it's absolutely beautiful. Really doesn't take that long to make. Um, definitely a... Uh, a lovely centerpiece to any holiday, whether it actually be Christmas or actually be Hanukkah or actually be Easter, whatever it is. Okay, finally on our Christmas recipes, we have my favorite Shitoren, which is the Japanese version of the German Christmas bread Stollen. Uh, this uh, slight tangent here. Um, Japanese Christmas is a very interesting topic to me. Even though only around 1% of the population of Japan is Christian, uh, Japan does actually celebrate Christmas um, in its own way. It's not a national holiday or anything, but um, in many ways, it's kind of like Valentine's Day is in the US, like, uh, or like Christmas Eve is anyway. Um, it's a evening for couples to go out to fancy dinners or stay overnight in a hotel, or um, it's like a big romance day. Uh, Valentine's Day in Japan is also really weird, but that's a whole other subject. Um, as for Christmas Day, it's usually celebrated by families um, with just like a quiet day at home um, and sometimes a few gifts, but it's not like a big like crazy thing like we do in America. Um, but there are two kind of inexplicable foods that have come to symbolize uh, Christmas in Japan. One is Christmas cake, which is a sponge cake that's frosted with whipped cream and decorated with strawberries and often like Christmassy scenes, like make the strawberries into little Santa Clauses or something. The other is KFC. And you did hear me right, that is Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's such a popular Christmas food in Japan that a lot of the times people will have to make reservations at KFC two months in advance to get their chicken. Uh, otherwise, um, you might be expected to wait in line for like up to two hours to get your chicken on Christmas day. Uh, this inexplicable food uh, craze is mostly thanks to a very successful, I would say, uh, 1974 ad campaign called uh, Christmas Niwa Kentucky, which is uh, Kentucky for Christmas. Um, however, the other day I saw a post by Makiko Ito, who's a blogger that I follow, um, and she was talking about how stolen, 
the German Christmas bread, uh, is a rising star in Japan. You can buy it at bakeries or you can make it pretty easily at home, uh, which might be part of why it's becoming popular. Um, because it's less fragile than cake, it also makes a really good gift and like food gifts are very popular in Japan. Um, she included a link in her blog, in her post that it was for a website from the dry goods company Tomis. And it had seven easy stolen recipes for you to make at home with their products. I like immediately clicked on it and found a obviously uh, Japanese website in Japanese. And I found uh, a button to translate it with Google, um, which technically worked like very technically, uh, but it was a horribly gar garbled uh, translation of the recipe. Like I follow a lot of Japanese uh, people and a lot of like Japanese food things. And a lot of the time, like recipes, especially translate horribly uh, with like translation programs. I think it's probably because Japan has a lot of um, homonyms in their language. So it like doesn't know what it's doing half the time when it's translating things. For example, this is a verbatim quote from this translated recipe. This is step four. When the powder is gone, tear off the middle seeds, knead the bowl until cod row, put on kneading table and knead for three to five minutes until seeds are completely mixed in and the dough is even. To be clear, there is no cod row in this recipe. I do not know what that means. <laughs> Luckily for me, there were also pictures um, in the recipe and uh, the ingredients list uh, with one notable exception that I figured out finally was salt um, were translated properly. And also luckily for me, I have actually made stolen in the past professionally at great quantities. So I um, was able to use my accumulated knowledge to work out this recipe. And I think that the results were fabulous. Um, I haven't written the blog post for it yet, but I will be elaborating more on the process um, in a blog post probably this weekend. Um, but this is actually made in two different doughs and then your fruit additions and then a batch of finishing things. So for the first dough, we've got 50 grams of flour, three grams of instant yeast and 40 milliliters of milk. I don't know how familiar you are with the metric system, but that is a minuscule amount of food. <laughs> uh, for the second dough, it's 100 grams of flour, 20 grams of sugar, two grams of salt, 20 grams of almond flour, a half a teaspoon of cinnamon, a quarter teaspoon of cardamom, 25 grams of eggs, and 50 grams of butter at room temperature. You'll notice that doesn't have any yeast in it. There is hardly any yeast in this dough. And then you're gonna want about 200 grams of mixed fruit and 20 grams of toasted almonds, or you can toast your own almonds. Um, so for the mixed fruit, like usually uh, stolen is made with um, candied fruit and that rests true for this recipe as well. Um, Tomas is, uh, candied fruit. Um, I obviously can't eat candied fruit myself and it's, um, uh, I don't, I don't like candied fruit. Like even when I could eat it, I didn't like it. It's like usually got a lot of different stuff in it, a lot of dyes and things, probably not in Europe but, or in Japan, but um, in America, certainly. Um, so I actually used 200 grams of dried fruit, mostly apricots. Um, some figs, some currants, and some cranberries. And I thought it was lovely. Um, then to finish, you're gonna want 60 grams of butter melted and uh, 50 grams of confectioner sugar to uh, dust it with. So to begin with, you chop up all of your fruits and um, leave them out for later. Uh, toast your almonds if you're not using pre-toasted. Then you're gonna mix together the flour, yeast, and milk for the first dough. And you're gonna mix it all together if you can work with such a small amount of stuff. And then you're gonna very carefully uh, knead the world's smallest bread dough. Um, after about five minutes when it's nicely kneaded dough, um, you're gonna wanna cover it in a bowl. You can use a tiny bowl for this. And you're gonna set it aside to rise for a half an hour. Um, uh, yeah, let it rise for a half an hour. Um, 
about 20 minutes later, when you've got 10 minutes to go on that, you're going to want to make your second dough. You're gonna um, cream your butter, put in your almond flour and spices, um, put in your confectioner sugar, all that stuff. You're gonna mix it together like you're making cookies. Everything except for the uh, dried fruit and the almonds. Once it's all stuck together, you're gonna take the world's smallest bread dough and you're gonna tear it up into little pieces and put it into your, uh, your cookie-like dough. I'm not gonna lie, at this point, I wasn't sure if this recipe was gonna work. Then you knead it together for about five minutes until it's all nicely incorporated. Um, then you're going to take pretty much the exact same volume of dried fruits and nuts and smush it into your dough, mix it up um, so it's all fully incorporated, uh, make it into a nice circle, um, cover it and let it rise for another 30 to 40 minutes. And you're gonna wanna cut it in half and um, form those into balls uh, and cover that and let it rest for 10 minutes. Then you're gonna take a rolling pin and roll it into a nice um, oval that is about four uh, inches by seven inches-ish. These are very small breads, by the way. And you're gonna wanna fold them, not quite in half, you want a little bit of an underhang. Um, is underhang a word? I don't know, that's the only way I know how to describe it. About an inch you, uh, you want on the bottom sticking out. Put them on a pan, let them rest for 30 minutes. You would think with all this resting, there was a lot of rising happening, but there really isn't because there's hardly any yeast in this. Um, then you're going to want to preheat your oven to 350 degrees, and then you're going to cook it for 30 to 40 minutes until they're nicely browned. Uh, once they're done, put them on a cooling rack. You're going to melt that 60 grams of butter that you had set aside, and you're going to want to brush it onto the bread while it's still hot. Uh, you want all of that 60 grams of butter. You need all those calories. Um, so you just want to keep brushing it as it absorbs into the bread. You want to get the bottom of it too. Then uh, when it's completely cool, I actually waited until the next morning to do this. Uh, you're gonna wanna dust on your confectioner sugar, make sure you trim the bread so you get all the edges and everything so it's nicely white, uh, snowy looking delightfulness. I absolutely loved this recipe. The bread had such a nice texture. I was expecting it to be super dry like, um, like biscotti or soda bread, but it was really, moist. It was like pound cake and bread mixed together. And it had like a really nice balanced level of fruits and nuts in it. It wasn't too sweet. The little bit of powdered sugar on the outside was like just the perfect complement. I ate like an entire loaf in like one sitting. Uh, yeah, it was totally delicious. Um, and because it's pretty easy to make, even though there's like a lot of like resting time, um, but like in general, there's not a lot of hands-on time that you're spending on it. You could totally make these for gifts for people um, and they would love it. Okay, so next up on our list of holidays um, is Boxing Day or St. Stephen's Day. This is December 26th, which is the day after Christmas. Um, it originated in the UK and it's still celebrated there and in a number of countries that formerly made up parts of the British Empire. Sort of like Black Friday in the US with huge sales that happen. It's also a big football day, uh, soccer, and a rugby day, like a lot of different leagues have important games on, that, on Boxing Day. Alternatively, some countries or places call it St. Stephen's Day. That would be like Ireland, Wales, Austria, Serbia, Finland, uh, other places. Um, you might recognize this as uh, the day that good King Wenceslas looked out. Um, there are a lot of traditions depending on location. Uh, perhaps most notably, the Wren's Day celebrations, Wren like the bird, um, in parts of Ireland where um, people dress up as like Wren's boys, where they're wearing these like straw costumes um, or with masks travel from door to door carrying fake wrens. I'm not really sure what they do with those, but that's what they do. Um, and as far as like Boxing Day foods go, uh, seems to be like 
ease of preparation is the name of the game. It's a lot of buffet style food because like who wants to cook a bunch of food the day after Christmas. And in that way, St. Stephen's Day pie is like the perfect meal. Um, it's made like a shepherd's pie with uh, mashed potatoes on the top. Um, but the filling is turkey and ham. Uh, since turkey and ham are both meats that are traditionally eaten on Christmas by a lot of people, uh, it's a great leftovers pie. I actually make it usually the day after Thanksgiving because we usually don't do turkey again on Christmas. Um, in fact, this pie here was made with my Thanksgiving leftovers. Uh, but it's just a really great way to use up leftovers after a holiday meal. So for this, you're going to want four cups of mashed potatoes, one cup of leftover turkey, one cup of leftover ham, a uh, half an onion, um, two cloves of garlic, some turkey gravy, uh, salt and pepper, uh, majorum or uh, poultry seasoning, um, some butter some or vegetable oil, and some frozen mixed vegetables or peas. All right, so this actually comes together really fast. So you're just gonna take a skillet put some oil or butter in the bottom and you're gonna saute your onions until they are, your onions and your garlic until your onions are starting to turn translucent. Translucent. Then you're going to add in your other ingredients besides the mashed potatoes and the gravy. You're gonna let those heat up a bit. Then add in your gravy, let it cook a little bit um, and make sure everything's sticking together. Add more gravy as needed. Then you can either transport for it to a casserole dish or cook it directly in the um, skillet if you don't have a tiny stove like mine. Um, I reheated my mashed potatoes just by putting a little water in a pan and putting the mashed potatoes in it and sort of um, covering it and letting it warm up that way just to make it easier to spread. Then I spread the mashed potatoes over the top and I used just a spoon to give it a little pattern on the top. And then you bake it at 350 degrees for about 25 minutes until the edges are bubbling and it's got a nice brown top to it. Um, this is certainly a really easy dish. You can throw it together in about 10 minutes and then just cook it. Um, and it's a great way to sort of transform what you just ate the day before. So I definitely recommend it, um, whether you use it next year for Thanksgiving leftovers or whether you use it for Christmas leftovers. Next, we have Kwanzaa. Um, this is a holiday uh, celebrating celebration of um, African-American culture. It was first celebrated in 1966 in the aftermath of the Watts riots. Um, Dr. Mal Malawana uh, Karanga, a major figure in the Black Power Movement, created the holiday to allow Black Americans to celebrate their history and culture rather than just taking on the practices of the dominant society. Uh, he based many of the practices off um, African harvest festivals and traditions from various locations across um, Africa. It was initially intended to replace Christmas, um, but as Kwanzaa like, grew in mainstream recognition, uh, Karinga changed his position so, that, uh, so he didn't alienate um, practicing Christians. And today, many African Americans who celebrate Kwanzaa do so along with Christmas. Kwanzaa celebrated throughout the US and other nations of the African diaspora in North America. It's a week long celebration culminating in a feast and gift giving. Um, there are also seven principles, or there are, yeah, seven principles of, sorry, I got confused there for a second because there are seven principles of co-ops. And I was like, oh no, I'm mixing them up. No, there are seven principles, which are um, represented by the seven candles um, that are used during Kwanzaa, um, which are green, black, and red. And um, those principles are, Hold on a second. Um, Emoja, which is unity, to strive for and to maintain unity in the family, community, nation, and race. Uh, Kujimchagulia, which is self-determination, to define the name and name ourselves as well as to create and speak for ourselves. Ujuma, which is collective work and responsibility to build and maintain our community together and to make our brothers and sisters problems our problem and to solve them together. Ujamaa, 
uh, cooperative economics to build and maintain our own stores, shops, and other businesses and to profit from them together. Mia, purpose, to make our collective vocation the building and developing of our community in order to restore our people and their traditional greatness to their traditional greatness. Kumba, uh, creativity, to do a, always as much as we can in a way that we can in order to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than we inherit it. And Imani, faith, to believe with all our hearts in our people, our parents, our teachers, our leaders, and the righteousness and victory of our struggles. So it's a really cool holiday that has a lot of meaning and symbolism to it. Traditional foods of Kwanzaa definitely depends on who's celebrating it, but um, certainly a lot of soul foods um, are eaten during Kwanzaa. Um, these might include collards, cornmeal, macaroni, uh, jerk chicken, um, Cajun foods like gumbo, uh, which is like a seafood stew, um, jambalaya, acris, which is like a Caribbean fritter, um, fiajodia, which is a black bean stew, other soul foods, pretty much delicious, delicious foods. Um, for this, we did, I, well, actually my mother made it. This is jambalaya. Uh, this is actually our family's recipe. So jambalaya um, comes from Louisiana and I come not from Louisiana, but from Alaska. And um, Louisiana and Alaska have in common that they're both big oil states. So a lot of oil workers in both places. And when the Exxon Valdez um, oil spill happened, which was when my family was living in Alaska, uh, we had a friend of the family who um, went to volunteer on the cleanup. There were a lot of Louisiana um, oil workers who were there and they uh, got real close together and um, shared a lot of their recipes. And uh, so my family actually has two cookbooks that were sort of put together by these um, oil workers during the Exxon um, Valdez uh, disaster. And so we got really into cooking uh, Cajun food when I was a kid and uh, jambalaya has always been our favorite. So this is actually my mom's jambalaya recipe got from the Cajun oil workers uh, long ago. So you're gonna want uh, three onions chopped, one whole bunch of celery chopped, five peppers of any color chopped, one clo clove of garlic minced, two packages of sausage cut into bite-sized pieces. You can use like any kind of sausage, but we like to use like andouille um, or you can use like a Italian sausage if you want a slightly less spicy thing. Um, two cans of smoked oysters, two cans of chopped clams, and then an eight ounce can of tomato puree uh, or diced or crushed, uh, tis, uh, two tisps of oregano, and one tisp of Cajun spice or to taste if you want it a little spicy. If you want it even spicier, you can add in some, uh, uh, <laughs> oh my God, I can't think of it now. <laughs> Cayenne pepper. And then you want salt and pepper to taste. And you're also gonna want some rice to serve it with. So to start, you're gonna coat a pan with some oil and put in your vegetables, except for the garlic and tomatoes. So your celery, uh, peppers, and onion, and you're gonna cook those up. While those are cooking, you want a separate pan to um, cook your sausage in, and you wanna brown it or cook it completely if it's an uncooked sausage. And then when the sausages are done cooking, you wanna drain off the excess fat and then throw them into the pot with the vegetables. Add in your other ingredients, your um, tomatoes, spices, salts, um, stir that up. Then, um, let's see, you're going to want to cook that for about 10 minutes. Then you're going to add in your oysters, your clams, and your garlic at the end. Carefully stir those in and then um, let it cook for probably another two minutes and then you're good to go. And you're going to want to serve it over rice. So this is uh, really delicious. It's got um, a lot of flavor. The sausage is so tasty. Um, the rice really balances out the spice palette nicely. 
Um, we just can't get enough of jambalaya in our family. Um, it's definitely one that we cook at a lot of celebrations. The last time we had it was actually uh, my sister's boyfriend's uh, birthday that we had an outdoor celebration and we made a humongous pot of it. Um, so it's a great one for uh, big family gatherings or small family gatherings. And uh, lastly, we have, is this lastly? Yeah, this is lastly. We have um, New Year's Day or New Year's in general. Uh, New Year's has been celebrated by most Europeans on the 1st of January since 153 BCE with the Roman calendar. Today, it's like the official beginning of the year for modern, modern society. But there's also other calendars, traditional calendars, notably um, the Chinese, uh, Hebrew, and Islamic calendars, which have their own New Year's. Um, there are many traditions from all across the globe. Most uh, like the US involve gathering with loved ones and ringing in the new year. In Japan, it's like the biggest holiday of the year with many people traveling home to be with their families. The first sh shrine visit of the year is also really important with many stalls selling hot food and drinks um, to the uh, gatherers. Traditional foods of New Year definitely vary place to place, uh, but they include tortillere, um, champagne, citrus fruits, because it's citrus season, um, amanzaki, which is a hot rice wine, more hot fermented rice drink, um, zenzai, which is a sweet azuki bean soup um, with mochi, soba noodles, grapes, which are eaten in Singapore. Um, it's traditional to like, with each stroke of the, the um, bell on, or, you know, stroke of the clock on midnight to eat uh, a grape with each one. Um, tamales, um, odelbolin, which is a Dutch fried dumpling, um, marzipan schnitzwins, <laughs> which is uh, marzipan pigs, pickled herring, king's cake, which is the one where you hide the coin in it, whoever finds the coin is like awesomely lucky, um, and pranza cake, which is the um, Norwegian wreath cake tower, you might have seen it, where it's like a bunch of wreath cakes that are all stacked together and then they stick like Norwegian flags in it. That's a New Year's thing. But for our final recipe, we have tortillere, which is a French Canadian meat pie. This is actually my grandmother's recipe. Um, she didn't like necessarily make it for New Year's, but it was like any um, family gathering. My uh, mame would always make tortillere. Um, it's big in Quebec. It's also big in New Brunswick, which is where my family's from. Um, so for this, you're gonna want a uh, two pie shell uh, recipe, such as I used for the, uh, what do you call it? The minced meat pies. Then the filling is a pound of ground pork, one medium on onion chopped finely, half a teaspoon of salt, half a teaspoon of cinnamon, a pinch of cloves, one teaspoon of poultry seasoning, two and a half cups of mashed potatoes, which is like three pounds of cooked potatoes mixed with two tablespoons of butter one clove of garlic minced, two tart apples finely chopped, and then you're gonna want an egg wash with one egg and a little bit of water. Oh, excuse me. This recipe just like brings me back so much to my grandmother's kitchen and family gatherings when I was a kid. Absolutely love it. Uh, you're gonna start by chopping up your potatoes and boiling them until they're um, so, uh, tender or soft enough to put a fork through. Then you're gonna wanna put in your butter and mash them up, set aside. You're gonna take your onions and um, saute them until they are translucent or starting to get translucent and add in your fork and break it up with a spatula until it's nice and crumbly. Then you've gotta add in your spices and stir it up and cook it. Once the meat starts to brown, you wanna add your um, apples in there and then cook for another couple of minutes. Finally, you're gonna add your potatoes and your meat together. You can give it a little taste and see if the salt needs to be uh, adjusted. And you're gonna make your pie dough. Um, pretty much you're gonna make it the same way I told you to make the other one. You're gonna cut up your butter, put it in the, the flour with the salt, crush it up with your fingers until you've got little, um, pea-sized pieces, then you're gonna to wanna to just stick it together with some cold water. You're gonna to wanna to roll it out. As you can probably tell, I made this one with whole wheat flour instead of regular flour. 
uh, then you're going to cut it out to about three inch diameter circles. And you're going to put in about two to three tablespoons of filling. Moisten the edge of your circles with a little bit of water and pinch tight your edges. Uh, put them on a sheet, egg wash, and then you're going to bake them for approximately 20 minutes in a 350 degree oven until they're nicely browned. And then you're going to enjoy eating them. They're uh, good hot, they're good cold. The potato and the meat together is like classic, but then you've got that um, sweet tart apple in there. It's really nice, minimal spice in there, um, or not spice like heat, but spice like spices. Um, so it's just got this really nice balanced flavor, the crispy uh, dough outside, this yummy inside, and then they're like handheld size, size. So they're really easy to eat. They're great for um, gatherings. I could like literally eat a million of them. I mean, not literally, obviously, but figuratively eat a million of them. So yeah, definitely recommend. And it's like super traditional recipe for my family. So that's the end of the class. Um, we have three more classes. I just added two more classes to the schedule, but there's gonna be more time in between them. Um, because my schedule is just not going to allow me to do um, them more uh, together. But um, we have no sugar baking for the new year, which is January 6th at 4 p.m. on Wednesday. I'm really excited about that one because, as I mentioned before, I don't eat sugar. So I uh, have about four or five years of accumulated knowledge about how to uh, still enjoy baking um, when that's the case. So I'm excited to share that with you. Then we've got um, Sushi 101 on Wednesday, March 17th at 4 p.m. People are always asking me about sushi because they know that I do Japanese cooking. And so I am finally uh, going to be um, sharing the sushi with everyone. Uh, we're going to do a lot of different kinds of sushi, recognizable sushi, um, more obscure sushi. So that's going to be fun. And then uh, the Art of Bento Box Lunches, um, which is going to be Wednesday, May 26th at 4 p.m. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with bento boxes, um, but they're packed lunches that there's like a whole bunch of different ways you can do them, but they can be really creative. Um, they can be like super healthy or they can be super not healthy depending on how you're making them. Um, so we're gonna mostly focus on healthy versions. Um, I haven't done it in a while because I've been working from home, but I used to pack myself a bento box every day for work. And usually you can do it in under 20 minutes. And if you like prep a lot beforehand and like keep stuff on hand, you can usually get it done in about 10 minutes. Um, so we're gonna have fun with that one. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. And um, don't forget to uh, get your recipe packet tomorrow from our website if, um, if you would like the updated version of the jambalaya. It's pretty much the same recipe except for that in the original version, I didn't mention that the sausage is cooked separately. So if you can remember that, then, then don't bother. But um, yeah, uh, my hope you have a wonderful holiday season, um, no matter what holiday you're celebrating. And um, yeah, have a great night.